I guess now it's time for episode 29 of the Stage Left podcast. That was a bit of Milton McDonald playing uh, Back for Good by Take That. You can hear more of that later on. Um, he's also a member of Jeff Lynne's ELO, who are just about to be inducted to the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as I, as I record this. Um, you're going to find loads of inf- interesting information about uh, an interesting insight about both those acts, as well as the likes of um, Ray Davies of the Kinks, um, uh, Mick Jagger. Um, you know, our guest today has, has worked with loads of fantastic people. Um, just a quick shout out to uh, those who provided lovely feedback on the previous episode uh, with John Waffer, the 1975. Just after we recorded that, they won the best group at the Brit Awards, which is a great thing. So well done to them. Uh, on the same night, um, Black Star by David Bowie won best album at the Brit Awards, uh, which was obviously produced by uh, Tony Visconti, who um, is, was our guest on episode 15, and we recorded an in-depth talk about what it was like recording Bowie's final album um, just a few days before Bowie passed. Um, other episodes we have on our website uh, are with the likes of uh, Michael Jackson's uh, uh, guitarist for 10 years, uh, Jennifer Batten, uh, members of Fleetwood Mac, um, uh, Paul McCartney's guitarist, Lawrence Juba, uh, Elvis Presley's pianist, Shane Keister, loads of stuff. So check that out on stageliftpodcast.com. Upcoming episodes, um, next month's episode at the end of April will be with a member of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Um, we also have um, confirmed uh, for September now uh, uh, an original member of Craftwork, which is going to be absolutely incredible. Um, and we just recorded an episode with a fully fledged full-time member of Guns N' Roses. Um, So that's going to be coming out soon. We tend to release an episode at the end of each month. So please uh, like us on Facebook, um, subscribe to us, whether you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, podcast apps, and you'll get notifications when new episodes are out. Um, You can follow us on Twitter at the Stage Left Pod, and we have an Instagram page as well now. Um, This guy has sung and uh, played uh, guitar on so many classic songs uh, that that have come out of the UK uh, that, that have populated um, the radio waves in the pop music world uh, over the last 25 years or so. So I hope you enjoy listening to him singing uh, and playing guitar on some of these songs um, and get in touch and let us know what you think of the episode. So here we go. Here's episode 29 with Milton McDonald. Have a little patience Okay, welcome to the Stage Lift podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. Um, Today we're joined by Milton McDonald, uh, a man whose home turf is playing to sold out stadiums on a global scale, uh, an unsung hero of the music industry who's collaborated with greats in the world of rock and pop uh, and has played some of the most high profile, high pressured concerts um, over the past two decades. Firstly, his guitarist would take that, um, but also touring with Ray Davies, Anderson Bruford Waitman and Howe, um, playing with Mick Jagger, Jamiroquai, Tina Turner and Smokey Robinson. In recent times, our guest today has been stage right to the enigmatic and much-loved Jeff Lynne. Um, not only was Jeff Lynne once in a supergroup with George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty and Roy Orbison, uh, it was Jeff who was called upon by the three remaining Beatles uh, to help fill John Lennon's void for the 1994 anthology records. As part of Jeff Lynne's ELO, our guest today has played Hyde Park, Glastonbury, the Hollywood Bowl, um, and is gearing up for one night only at Wembley Stadium this summer, which caps off a remarkable comeback uh, for Birmingham's finest. Um, so we'll be finding out what a musician might learn from working with Jeff that they wouldn't learn from working with anyone else. Um, Having spent a career uh, playing to hysterical screaming fans at pretty much every Take That concert uh, of the last 24 years, we'll be getting insight into what fame really looks like from close quarters, Uh, we'll get advice for young musicians, uh, and we'll find out the question on the lips of every listener right now, did Milton cry when Take That split? I know I certainly did. So it's a pleasure to say our guest today on the Stage Podcast is none other than Milton McDonald. Uh, Thanks for joining us today, Milton. How's it going? 
Very well, thank you, mate. Good stuff. Um, so you've got a busy summer ahead of you. I believe um, rehearsals are going to be starting for some shows this summer? Yeah, we start uh, rehearsals. We take that in April, um, a few weeks of that in London, and then we go to production rehearsals for that. It's always a big old kind of do because there are, you know, there'll know there be dancers, so they do separate dance rehearsals with the boys. We do music rehearsals. Then we kind of uh, all get together and hope it fits. It's like building the, you know... Building the uh, uh, train track from two ends, you know. Wow. It's not quite because there's a lot of, you know, we kind of know what's happening. There's lots of emails and bits sent back and forth. but um, And then we rehearse with them and then, you know, figure out how to how to kind of make it work on a stage. Uh, this one's in the round, which I've never done with them before. So it's uh, presenting some different um, uh, problems. The main one for me is that I have to use in-ears on this tour. Like, oh. Really, and I'm, and I'm, it's, a, it's a kind of a... Personal bugbear of mine. I've, I've, wherever I, wherever possible, I don't use them. It's you know, it's my role. But sometimes, and this one, I don't think we even have like uh, sight lines. So, what are the uh, benefits or, or, or disbenefits, if you like, of using in ears compared to wedges? So, a lot of our music, a lot of our listeners are musicians, um, but they might not be in such a privileged <coughs> position to be able to pl- play with in ears. So, what are the what are the benefits and and the benefits are uh, well. The, the benefit, the be- I think it benefits different people. Like um, for vocal, my wife's a, a singer. You know, she she sings with uh, with Jeff too, and she prefers in ears because she spent years of doing gigs on wedges with the band, <laughs> just like drowning them out and go, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, so for for precision, you know, ears are great because you, you you're hearing detail. I would say if you're a guitarist, and I, I know several, you know, sort of pro guitar players, and they they use them and, and seem to be fine, but it just sounds tiny and tin, you know, tin yeah, yeah. kind of. It doesn't, you know, fundamentally, there's not actually any air moving, so you just don't get the. I don't think you get the weight of a of a guitar sound for kind of rhythm guitars and clean guitars. That it's it kind of works, but if you're soloing, it is just. Um, like a you know wasp in a jam jar. And really? Yeah. I, for, I mean, you know, you'll you'll talk to other people, and I'm sure they all have their own opinions. But I, yeah. I really find and my, and my my thing was with them that you know if you if you if you if you play a big old kind of power chord or a note, and it has its own kind of weight and it and it has its length, you know, so so, so you can let that note kind of decay, and it still it still means something. But with it is, you play the note and it just like thins to nothing, oh. and so you just play a little bit more because you've kind of you know, you feel like you've left a gap, and it, and it, I felt it. It kind of changed how I played to some extent, right. which to me is the tail wagging the dog. Then you know, it, you know. What about communicating on stage with the rest of the band? Is that is that a barrier as well, or do you um, not need to do that? On the no, end? well, no. It, it, I mean, it is that. You, I mean, the thing is, if you're if you're on a big stage, you know, you you can't really communicate in real time anyway. I, you know, but uh, and is are really useful for that because. Um, the MD can because you have a the MD can have will have a separate mic, and, and in fact everyone has a separate mic, uh, w- which they can sort of communicate. That's not it's not going out front. It's purely going in the ears one to another. So so you can kind of talk while the song's going. The MD can be telling you something, and I've done, I've done I won't name any names. But I've done a couple of tours with a couple of MDs who like to talk a lot while you're playing. Oh, nice. And it's I mean, no, it's sort of funny because they go, "Come on, come on, it's coming up, it's coming up, your sound is coming." Go away. Like that, really, and it's sort of like it's sort of funny, and also if something goes wrong, which which can happen, you know, if some if, if if there's some sort of you know car crash about to happen with the arrangement or something, you know, like we'd we'd have bits with with take that particularly where they might go out in the audience, so then you'd have to kind of go around a bit until they were going to come back, and then you know, the, and they'd be all getting mobbed in the audience, and then they'd come back on stage, and we bang into the the action, yeah. whatever it is, um, and so. But that's if you're if if you're just individually all trying to figure out when you're going to do that, mm. that could be tricky. So the MD can kind of go, all right, the back, the back, the back. Come on, let's go. Wow. So it actually works well for for communication. Yeah. And you can talk to like for example, you can talk to the the um, monitor engineer and just say, can I have a bit more? You know, which you sort of can't. You know, you don't really want to be doing that on the yeah. mics going up front. All that's good. But it just doesn't. It Takes doesn't away from sound. It. Yeah, it doesn't sound big to me. And I, you know, that in the end, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've had years of really loud music. You know, probably like most of the people you've spoken to. So, I've got a bit of tinnitus, and and, and my wife will tell you I'm a bit Mutt and Jeff. You know, I don't hear things you know all the time. But 
it, it, it's that or or don't enjoy you know it's, it just sounds good when it's loud and this isn't great advice for you <laughs> <laughs> no it's a great insight though. but it's, it's you know I think most if you talk to most guitarists in my sort of uh, vintage you know we're, we're all a bit deaf you know <laughs> but it just sounds better that way you know and as well as the take that shows you're playing with the ELO this summer yeah, we, I mean, it's it's. Uh, it, I mean, it worked out really fortunately for us because we we did a show. You know, we played with, with Take That and Gary, sort of solo thing for years, and uh, Gary was involved in the Children in Need Rocks mm. uh, uh, thing for for the BBC, and and because he was kind of involved, he got his band, the Take That band, to to uh, to be the house band. So we did about three of those things, and the last one we did was at Hammersmith Odeon, and and. Uh, Gary's a big fan of Jeff, as, mm. as are we all, frankly. And he persuaded Jeff to come on and do two songs, and Jeff hadn't done a gig for, I don't know, you know yeah, 15, 20 years or something. And and so we learned uh, two songs, we learned Blue Sky and Living Thing for that, and, and fortunately Jeff thought we'd done all right, you know, he, you know we, were, we were worried. But it was it was such a labour of love. We were rehearsing a whole set with, of, you know, I don't remember, eight or nine different artists, so Barry Manilow was on it, Robbie was on it, yeah. TT were on it, uh, I can't remember the one, it's a, a real, you know, mishmash yeah. of, of stuff, and at the end of the day, we'd always go, should we just do Blue Sky? Because <laughs> yeah. it's so, you know, you never get tired of playing Jeff's songs, they're so, uh, they're, they're just so kind of musical, you know, and um, so we've been fortunate in that we've been able to sort of juggle the, the two gigs and, and, and touch wood so far it's kind of worked out how does that work out so if you know would Jeff just have to get another band if it clashed with the, the take that thing and that's quite well, a big production to have to just recreate with I, it. I, I don't I mean I don't know in the end I think it's more I, th- I think it's who, who knows but I think it's more trouble than it's worth I mean it it's uh I don't, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, perhaps he would. But because it, you, it cause I saw a gig at the Grammys that he played last year. I didn't see you on stage for that. Mm-hmm. I was, I'd already, um, I'd already taken a gig with uh, Will Young, who I did a tour with a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, and I played on a couple of his records, like Don, you know, when he won mm. X Factor and things. But and um, I just, I, I, I took the gig, and and really, uh, his manager said, you know, can you definitely do it? And I said, oh, I should, I should probably just double check there's nothing in nothing I don't know about in, in the take that book or whatever and then there wasn't so I said yeah I'll do it was, um, was um, a charity gig in Scotland I think in, in Glasgow Edinburgh and, and I said yes to it and then the Grammys came through that like, the following day and there was an issue anyway because they were at the time they, they weren't they weren't sure they were going to take a full band anyway so they were kind of looking for if anyone didn't you know couldn't do it or didn't want to do it and I felt I'd you know I'd, I'd kind of you know given my word that I'd, that I'd do this other thing. And Ed Sheeran took your place on stage, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he was doing. I've never watched it. <laughs> I still I still get shit about it from the other boys. Really? Because yeah, because the other the, the other joke is, whenever um, there's been about two gigs I've ever missed. There's one with Take That, and 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 one with and that one the Grammys. And on both of those gigs, the other one was I can't remember what the Take That thing was, but. At the end of the take that one thing, it was sponsored by some company, and there was loads of like free clothes and boots oh. and watches and stuff, <laughs> and I didn't get it. And when they did the Grammys, you know, on the, those things, you get like a, a goodie bag of something. Really? They got they got a they got a Gibson guitar each. No, got, uh, yeah, um, the you know I can't remember that. Like, but every time I would I'd be sitting on a plane next to Donovan the drummer, I go, yeah, nice boots, mate. Like genuinely, you go. Yeah, got them. Uh, got them on that day. You didn't do, mate. And they, they, yeah, they all got guitars on the on the grass. So it's it's they'll always go. And because they had a, it was you know it's a beano. You go out to LA and have a brilliant time, you know, and sunshine and everything. And and uh, and they'll always start to telling stories about it. And how how great ACDC was. That's the one I was here. I, I never saw with Brian Johnson, and you know now, I guess I never will. When it came to learning Mr. Blue Sky and, and, and Living Thing, what was the remit? Was it just kind of pick up the guitar and, <clears> and, and play what's on the record? And how did you divide up the parts with other members of the band? Who, who makes that decision? That, it was um, the first thing we did. Uh, I should remember the sequence actually, because we just did two songs and 
vocally, I mean, the, the vocal thing's important on that because we, on, and actually, um, uh, Ian uh, Horner, who's the, one of the two kind of dedicated vocalists uh, who does, mm. does Jeff's gig, um, he kind of, I think he got the, the kind of the short straw, the long straw, whatever, and he, he had to figure it all out. Um, and I think Jeff sent over a lot of stuff, some stems and things, so you could hear some of it uh, sort of in isolation. But I think not all of it, and, and, and some, of, some of it just wasn't, like we've got f- five, I think we had six voices on that actually. Mm. Excuse me, and um, even then it's kind of, you know, with everyone doing everything sometimes, it's, not, it's just not possible to, to do it all, so we would have to kind of slightly compound some bits and all that. Um, those two we kind of, we, we tried to do really, in fact I was going to say we tried to do it really carefully, we, we've done it all really carefully, because Jeff, the thing about Jeff is he, 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 he wrote those songs kind of from the inside out, so if he, sit and, if he, if he sits and plays them, like he plays every kind of bit in, in within his guitar playing, by which I mean all the bits that are important, they're in his guitar part. And um, it was amazing watching him watch watching him do stuff like, like in Mr. Blue Sky, for example. Basically, I just ghosted him on it because um, he and we rehearsed without him first, so I just played it and I did the solo and everything, you know. Oh, nice. And um, and we used to take turns singing it because there was all these people who fancied to go away, you know, and. Um, and actually, I remember when, when we were rehearsing that, we, we, we got the call that he was coming. Uh, literally, we were in the rehearsal room. And, we're play- and, he, and he came in, like, somewhere in the first verse of Mr. Blue Sky with, like, me singing it, I think, because <laughs> Ian, was, Ian was having a break. And, he, and as I remember it, he, he kind of came in and took over for the second verse, as I remember it. I might be slightly... Nice. I think it did, though. And, um, and appa- what he, what, apparently what he said is, is his wife said to us, you know, he, he was, you know, he had his sort of, you know, he was, had his doubts when he was coming over on the plane, but how would this be, you know, with, with this, this band he'd never met, would they yeah. you know, be, kind of get it, would they be playing it right? And, and apparently he said, yeah, they know it better than me. So, you know, which isn't true, but, he, he, you know, he, we, it was a labour of love. We really wanted to get it right. And, you know, and when, I, the, when none of us... Um, We've all kind of been around the block, really. Everyone's yeah. around with various things, um, so we all understand what you know how important it, important it is, and and I think we all realise just just how great he is, really. You know, just 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 how great he is. You touched upon his um, his doubts about it, and he's quite um, he's quite expressive um, on stage at that first gig at Hyde Park mm. um, about how I mean, he's, there was rumours going about that he thought and had said that he was worried people going to leave before you came on and that kind of thing. So I think it was headlining a day long festival, yeah. uh, Radio Two or something like that. Um, and um, he's, it's after each song you really hear him saying, "Oh wow, this is amazing!" You know, I, I can't mm-hmm. believe this. Did, did you pick up on that anxiety beforehand? Not really. He's very. Um, I mean, he's so self-deprecating. He's he's funny because he's you know he's he's from Birmingham and but he's lived in uh, Los Angeles for I don't know thirty years or you know whatever it is since since the height of ELO really um, in his beautiful little you know bungalow up in the hills and 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 there's a couple of brummies in the band uh, Marcus and, and Donovan are from Birmingham and they both said. So he's, he talks like a brummy, but he talks like a brummy from the 70s. Like, you know, because they, they, they don't really talk like that in Birmingham anymore. It's kind of, you know, morphed it. But he still has, has this, say, and he's and he's just got this incredibly, like he's 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 such a dry wit. He's, he's very self-deprecating and he can be quite, not brutal, that's not the word, but he's, but he's, he's he'll, yeah. he'll say something quite cutting and then a minute later he'll just go, I'm oh, sorry, man, I didn't, I didn't really mean that. Because he's, he's just very quick-witted, so he'll say it. But, um... He, I think he was. I mean, he, he hadn't done a gig for a long time. I mean, you know, I, I, we fairly recently watched a concert for George, which I'd, I'd never seen. You know, uh, you know, which he because he he said, you know, it was it was so difficult to mix because there's something ridiculous like nine guitarists on it or something. Oh something, right, yeah, yeah. A lot of them at the same time. And he was trying to make sense of the mix, you know, and that's that's. He, he, so did he mix that mm, for the DVD? I'm guessing. Mm, or something. Oh wow, yeah, yeah, that must have been. And it's and it's and we, you know we watched it in in here on the telly and you know the sound up and it's and it's. Really good, and, you know, and apart from anything else, it's got you know like is there a Clapton on there and everything, and no one's no one's kind of uh, grandstanding like everyone's just just playing these brilliant songs brilliantly and playing like they just mm. you know, respect each other you know and it, and it's so and I think yeah so Jeff hadn't hadn't done a, a, a proper gig you know a full on gig with with him with his name above the door or whatever for 
uh, for literally for you know, more than a decade, I think. I can't remember. How many yeah, it's it 10, 15 years. And did you sense the relief after the first couple of songs? I mean, the crowd were pretty. I, I couldn't tell. You know, I didn't have anything to compare it to. You yeah, kind of. I mean, well, we we done the the um, we done the the, the children need thing, and and that you know that went down a storm. You know, but but it was in a theatre. It was announced with Odie, and then it was you know part of a big show. But. Um, I mean, I just, I, 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 never, I don't think we had any doubts because it was, because, because it's so, he's so brilliant, it's so brilliant. No one's heard these songs played live, you mm. know, forever. Uh, it had sold, you know. I, I could, I didn't see that there was anything to worry about. Um, but then, it, you know, I've done a lot of gigs where I, I don't have to worry if it sells or not. I, you know, then yeah. I will still get paid. So, but I, you know, I, I, you know, it's understandable, isn't it? You just. What, one question I do have is that um, what. When you do gigs like these, um, and uh, uh, so there's particular sounds that you need to recreate, is the onus on you as the individual to recreate the specific sound, or do you get support with that or help or direction of... So if you take, like, the intro to Strange Magic, mm. it's, got, it's got that kind of two-tone effect. I don't know if you're playing at the same time as someone else. Well, I mean, Mike played it, yeah. Right. And in fact, we found out... We, we, Mike and I both had our, uh, our opinions on that, and... Um, and uh, we decided, or we, we went with, play, it's, it's kind of, it sounds, to me, it sounded like two lines, you know, two two lines that are kind of in harmony. So that's how we did it. I think I did the lower one. Mm. <laughs> I was just, I was trying to play it this morning, and I don't think I can. Go on, give it a go. Can you give it a go? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try, but it'll only be one, one half of it. Yeah, and right. this is the one that me and Mike crone whenever it comes. Uh, How did you then decide upon the actual sound itself? Did did you listen to the record over and over again between the two of you? It, it or? I think it's. Um, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting thing now because with 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 some with some of the gigs that I do, we'll we'll get sent the the, the stems off the record. You know, so you literally get you know uh, Marcus who works with the kind of te- technology side of all, uh, what we do. He'll he'll send you the, the like the guitar part of a track, and um, in isolation, and you can drop it into like you know into a, a logic yeah. or something, and then and so you can actually see how it works, and and so you, so you can do it as literally copying sounds. I I, I don't because I come from a, a kind of the, old, the older days. I, I don't really want to do. I sort of feel like let's kind of explain it. You know, it, I don't think you have to absolutely. You know what? You know the thing is, you could what you could do is go right. What guitar did he play on? Which pickup was he on? Uh, what was the what was the amp? You know, did it was it? The, and I, I don't think that's what it is. Like if you were, you know, when you hear great guitar players, you know, a, a Jeff Beck or someone, uh, they'll sound like who they are. You know, and they and they can magically make you feel like it's a Les Paul or make you feel like mm. it's a, a slide guitar when it's not because they just know how to do and. I'm, I'm certainly not putting myself in that in, in the category, but that's what I think. I think you're just trying to get the feel of the thing rather yeah, than a very specific sound. That, that said, you know, there's no point in doing it on a on a BC rich yeah or whatever if it if it if it was a you know a, a, a national or something you know. You, but it's but it's and also with particularly with with the with the jazz stuff, it's the guitar sounds are pretty standard you know they're pretty much a Les Paul or, or a Strat and, yeah. a, and, a, and an amp loud mic you know yeah, yeah, yeah so it's not it's not too difficult to find find you know to, to kind of emulate it and it and it'll tell you if it's not you know it'll tell you if it's not not what he wants and can you play a little bit of living thing can you remember the intro um, to that? yeah I th- <laughs> that's got a capo on is it oh, no, uh, I don't think no, no no I think it hasn't it because a lot of his tunes end up in C, like being right. written in C, and you, you don't realise to you playing. But um, and what he does is, so when Jeff plays a song, like I say, it, or as I said, he 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 kind of vamps the whole song. So when he's so there's the obvious guitar parts that he's playing, but even when he's not really playing part parts, because he because he just knows what all the chords are, he chords are, he just kind of feels around and sort of mm. marks them, and it's really it's a really complete way of playing guitar. He plays his bar chords out of the thumb over, which I never do because my hands are too small. Yeah. But and it's just it's a proper old of the of the um, the older kind of musicians I've worked with. I mean I don't I mean older than me, <laughs> but you know so so like 
Ray Davis and Steve Howe and uh, and and Jeff. Um, they just got an old because they're just used to doing gigs with no frills from from when they were kids, you know. Yeah. No track and no you yeah. know, nothing clever, just amps and stuff. So they just really know how to play like a full song on the guitar, and um and that's what Jetta. So on the start of it, it's got the you know it's got the violin yeah. thing, and it, and basically the, the guitar part just goes right, but he's going. Ah, yeah. And you don't really hear it; you just sort of feel it. And it goes da da da. Fantastic. That's a that's a classic, isn't it? It's, it yeah, but it's uh, to me. It's funny until I played it. I you know I heard it as a as a kid, and I genuinely was a, a big fan of ELO from being a kid. I still wanted to play drums then, and I wanted to be like Bev Bevan. Wow. Um, but the, the, the songs that like like the bit where it goes. This changes you. That is beautiful, and it's and it's, it's an interesting chord progression. Was, isn't it? Yeah, and I thought it was something really complicated because it's because it just, the whole thing just sort of yep. shifts, but it's just it's just down it's just down a centre. I mean, he's just, all his as I say, his, his songs when you play them, they're just they're all around yeah regular kind of chords, you know, and to, and to get that much out of those chords, you know, I don't mean he doesn't have more chords, but he likes that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, big Excellent. Yeah. And um, so you obviously see the working relationship between Richard Tandy and, and Jeff, mm-hmm. and they've obviously been working together for many, many years. What's that like to be a part of, and, and could you describe that working relationship? Actually, the, the other thing I was going to say about the about the, the guitar part on um, the... But that's... Uh, Richard played that, and it is one guitar that he played. Really? And he was, when he came in, he went, oh, I, I did it. So, and then he, and he I haven't picked up a guitar for years, and he was, but, but he can... He played it, and he said, yeah. "He said, oh yeah, Jeff used to get me all the jazzy bits. Jeff used to get me to do." <laughs> so, so anyway, but um, they're just, um, I mean, you know, it's just, they're so, uh, you know, I wouldn't kind of profess to discuss their friendship, but I mean, they've just known each other forever, and God knows what they've been through, you know, and the, the turn and turn over of the band and all that, and and then nothing for years. But I know they were always in contact, and Jeff did some. I've seen some recordings he did at his house, just acoustic versions of of his songs with with Richard on piano, and Richard's just a very calm, very kind, and nice man, really. And and he, and he's you know a ridiculous rock and roll piano player. You know, he's 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 just uh, again. I mean, he's you know they go back like he play, like he told me we were talking about um, the song Blackberry Way by the by the Move. Um, but I was talking about it with him, and he went, "Oh yeah, I played harpsichord on that." And it's like, really? you know, these are—I didn't even know. You know, he said, oh, and it's—you know—it was like Birmingham, and I've heard Jeff talking on on uh, radio programs, and he just said, you know, we all said it seems like there was a gig every night, every hall had a band playing in it, and you would all go and see, and you, you know, you met Roy Wood and you met Richard, and what a, what a rich kind of time to have been, you know, to have been learning to be a musician. Really, I count myself very lucky that. I caught the tail end of, of the kind of golden age of, of like rock and pop, really. You know, in the I started in the eighties, kind of professionally, and it still was. You know, you still needed, if you wanted to play your songs live, you still needed some musicians who were good enough to do that. You yeah, know, you don't necessarily need that now because you can do. You know, you can you can run track, mm-hmm. and you can figure out. And the same in the studio. You know, you don't necessarily need. Uh, the best guitar player in the world to to play you a part because you if you can play a bit you can get it down you know and chop it about and move it up tune it and it and it will sound as good as anything and then mm. you, and our kind of power base has completely 
lost now because because they are we're not needed in the same way you know that, I think that's a hard thing for young musicians now that we used to be an, a necessary evil but necessary you know mm -hmm. to make music um, yeah and um, in regards to uh, Richard, have you? So he's is it a vocoder? Are you? I don't know exactly what. Yeah, you know, it's, I think so. I'm, I'm, have, have you had a go on it? Have you, have you seen how it works? <laughs> when he no, walks out of the room, do you say so? Funny, do you know what? Though it's funny, I haven't had a go on it. But when we when we first uh, were doing uh, Mr. Blue Sky, um, there's you know there's the bit at the end of it, and there's a bit where it says please, please, please send me, me over, right? Yeah. And they and they they wanted to and they they were going to record it. I think at first, and. I remember, and I remember a few people, oh no, a couple of people had a go at it <laughs> with Richard playing the chords because you you play the chords and then you you it, you I can't explain it very well, but you're playing a sound which then kind of is the sound is formed in your, in your mouth. So is the key coming from the, the notes that he's singing, if you like? Are they coming from the keyboard? Yes, he's not it singing is, it. Right, he does okay. sing it. Yeah. Because it's sort of impossible not to, I guess. But yeah. in fact, no, the notes, are, like if he played different notes, it would it was, be... Oh, right, okay, right. It would sound quite different, yeah. Uh, but no, I haven't had a go on that. Oh, okay. Um, mate, there's still time. Um, <laughs> great stuff. So, I mean, you, where did you grow up? Show, paint us a picture of you of you growing up and, and what you wanted to do when you were young. Did you always want to be a musician? and? Uh, uh, I wanted to be a footballer, really, and I think nearly everyone did. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and at least in growing up in the 60s, 70s, as well, I did. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think I got... I, I really liked music, and we used... To, um, we had records in the house, uh, and they'd be a mixture of my eldest older sister's records, which which were kind of, you know, uh, Tapestry by Carole King. There was, like, a best of Simon and Garfunkel... There was a, a Tim Buckley record. There was um, a, a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex record. You know, mm -hmm. there was that. And then there'd be my mum's records, which would be, uh, uh, you know, the best of Gilbert and Sullivan, Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah. Um, and and some classical stuff. And she liked some. She liked you know the kind of gentler end of of, of pop music, so sort of Simon Garfunkel and stuff. Um, but I listened to all those records kind of the same. And I bought records, but they'd be like. I bought I bought Beatles records, uh, kind of one at a time, like going you know going down the you know Saturday afternoon in town and to Bernadine's music and bought and and the first one I bought was Hard Day's Night and I used to kind of just buy a record and then just absolutely uh, devour it you know sort of inhabit it and and know it inside out. Uh, to what end? Was that to learn parts for it, or was it just to well, get an understanding of? I, did, I I wasn't playing guitar. This was this would be when I was probably seven or eight, and uh, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, I was in front of the mirror with a with a tennis racket, obviously. You know? Yeah. Um, but I, I I always sang, you know. It's you know, it's uh, that was kind of, and I always, I mean, it infuriated my sister particularly probably because I would always just sing a third harmony on everything. Would you? Yeah, and and to the point where when I was doing. I, we, I had a Kinks record as well, and uh, when I was when I was working with Ray, I was like doing BBs on the stuff, and I, and a couple of tunes I would say like, is there is there a third harmony on that? Because because I'm hearing that, and and he'd go, no, I don't think there is, but you can do it if you like. And it was because, wow, twenty five years or thirty whatever it is, got through forty years before, I'd been in you know my bedroom singing. So to me, it sounded like there was always should be a yeah. harmony because. This, you know, idiot child have been singing more and everything. And they don't need no as long as they gaze on Waterloo sunset, they are in paradise. If you're lucky, you pick up an instrument. And it's and it's it's right for you. It feels right, and it, I never wanted to put it down. And I spent, you know, ten years or whatever, just just playing it all the time, driving, you know, sort of girlfriends and people mad because I'd always have a guitar in my lap, you know. And I think really that's where that's where the the, the work was, you know. That's where I got good. Everything else, I think, I don't think I've improved greatly in the last thirty years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that thing of just being so familiar with the instrument. Because I because I wanted to, and so and because I had this mixture of, you know, classical stuff, and you know, I'm really familiar with kind of popular classical music, you know, um, because because it was playing in the house, and I, and I like I said, and, and Gilbert and Sullivan, which is like the most uncool 
you know, sort of English was <laughs> the best thing you could do. But they're, you know, they're brilliant, yeah. Arthur Sullivan. They're brilliant tunes and they're brilliant lyrics, actually, so quick and, you know. Yeah. And I think, you know, the trouble for some people is that they can, um, they end up listening to one kind of form of music almost exclusively. Mm. Uh, and so you don't get a broader picture. And, and for me, especially with the job that I've done, you know, playing for, like you say, from Take That to, you know, Alice Cooper or... Yeah you know Grace Jones or you know just just random Shirley Bassey you know like yeah to, that, that, that my childhood in, informs me how to how to do that you know my world seemed very small I was signing on not doing anything really, just yeah. playing guitar all the time at home, you know, just unplugged on me on the on the sofa and um so I decided I would I would answer some adverts and it was the days when Melody Maker still existed and, and you know, people lots of, you know, well known people had start made that got their start that way. Absolutely. So um so yeah, I, I, there was an audition for a band and I came down to London, I auditioned and it was it was a band um it was the nucleus, of, it was the rhythm section of a band called Blue Zoo that had some hits uh, in the early 80s um, and they'd kind of split up but the, but the bass player and drummer were going to carry on and, and so they were looking for a guitar player and I think, think they already had a singer by that time, I think. So I got that gig and then I just sort of moved to London and we started rehearsing and they had management, they were managed by... Uh, uh, Jazz Summers, who's no longer with us, who's and Simon Opia Bell, who were, were WAM's management at the time. Uh, and so I was in that band for two years. We we gigged around a lot, uh, and at the end of that kind of two year thing, we we did get a record deal with with um, WEA for for like two singles, and they gave us you know I think it was seven seven and a half grand or seven grand, and. Half of that went on the guy who's, who'd driven us around for the last few <laughs> years and, you know, lent us PA and whatnot. And I think I, I so I got, um, I bought a, a Fender Twin off the guitarist set of Joe Boxers. All right. And, uh, and I went on holiday to, with my then girlfriend to um, uh, Tenerife, I think. And that was like my advance. To, and, and, then, and then this was just before Christmas. And we made a, we, we made a, did a single and everything. Uh, and then in the new year, the, the woman who signed us uh, left and went to Polydor, went to another label. And then that was that. It was just that. And so a new person came in and just went, I don't know who any of these people are, you know. Really? So we were out. And so we, we went from like getting a record deal and that was, you know, I thought that, you know, that was it, you know, let's sort of buy a yeah. flats in London and, you know. And uh, and then being out of a deal, it feels like about half a, half an hour later, it was probably a few months. But and so and I just decided, I I just wanted to try and make some money doing music. So I answered another advert in the Zoeka, uh for a, a band. It was one guy really, but it was looked like a band called the Big Supreme that was signed to Polydor. Funnily enough, yeah. Uh, did you I, see the same person? I did. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and and we did we did uh, we did, I did an audition I kind of got the gig and then um, we and I, they they put us on a, a retainer which was a hundred pounds a week this was in nineteen eighty six and a uh, hundred pounds a week so it, and that wasn't a lot of money then but it was more than I'd got signing on <laughs> and it was. Uh, it was the first time I felt like I got paid for, for, for playing music and I, I, it sounds quite mercenary now but it was like it felt really because I'd been playing all my all those years and never actually got really yeah. got paid to do it and um and then it, and yeah so I did that for a while and then and then I started to meet people and do gigs and I suppose the big thing was the I jo- and then I joined a band uh, a rock band that was uh sort of half being managed by Brian Lane who's who's traditionally historically was Yes's manager right and um, he was looking after us and we, we were sort of gigging but then uh, John Anderson uh, Yes was wanting to make a record with not with the kind of Atlantic records Yes but with, with the original Street lineup Power. was it? Is that right? it's not strictly original but it's it's it was you know it an, was older a, an older version yeah. 
with with Rick Wakeman and Steve Howe and Bill Bruford and and I watched a bit of this real prog prog rock kind of yeah uh, it's um I mean it was a it, it was a, a a real kind of eye opener and also because I I by then I'd been I'd done a few years of doing sessions and in those days it was when every all the the drums were all pretty much program so everything was super kind of tight like super in time and metronomically so I'd sort of learned to play guitar like that because people you do a rhythm section like a, you know 16s are like you know whatever and people would be dropping in one 16th note of that that wasn't quite in time with the, with yeah. the drum or whatever so I so I got very good at being very um pretty good at being very precise and then <laughs> and uh, in like you know kind of like a three minute sort of format you know with, yeah. with quite repetitive pop music and then you know they gave me I mean it's the days of vinyl still so I got this when I finally got the gig I met John and this all went on and we went, went and played I went to France and we recorded guitars on this record and six months later I think you know I got a call from and that was that it wasn't I was never supposed to be doing it live and then six months later or whatever it was when the record came out Brian called and said, "Look, John wants you to do the tour as well because you, you know, the, some of the guitar parts you just stood on there, and and vocally it'd be really good to have you because Chris Squire wasn't doing it. So right? They wanted like a second voice to, to, you know, that was kind of strong, you know. Yeah. Uh, and sort of higher range. So, and they they gave me a load of records and a and a, and a proposed sort of set list. And I mean, it's just you know like some of those songs are half an hour long. You know, like, yeah. I, mean, I remember him giving me." Um, I, th- I think it's called Close to the Edge of the album but it's got the, the song Close to the Edge on it and I it is literally the side of a record it's like 20 years <laughs> something ridiculous and it and it it's you kind of listen I was I remember listening to it and just you know in, with sort of despair because I'd never heard it before <laughs> I, I had an album called Going for the One which I, with, that has wondrous stories on it and and Awaken and so I, I kind of it wasn't like it was a surprise yeah but it was a shock because it was so you know like you realise you, you're there's a, there will be songs where it appears to come, keep coming back to the same kind of verse thing, but when you look at it, it's never in the same key because they've kind of, you know, they've sort of, they used to put their records together with a guy called Eddie Offord, who was the sort of producer, and it would often be a kind of a mixture of one of John's bits and one of Steve Howe's bits and one yeah. of someone else's Rick's or whatever, and then they would kind of like splice it together either physically with tape or or sort of musically in a room just trying to find a way to make it flow yeah so so it made sense to them because they you know they 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 kind of written it and made made it up but when coming from the outside it was it was quite tough and it's what's interesting now is that lee pomeroy who's um who plays bass in in the elo thing and in take that oh right he's now on tour with anderson wakeman rabin which right. is a new version, a new yeah. combination. So he's doing all, and it's literally, I was doing this in 98, eight, sort of 88 to 90, and he's doing it this year with, with John. And I haven't seen them, but I'm hoping to go and see him actually, because I haven't seen John. I did something with John in Brazil around in, in 2000 with an orchestra, but I haven't seen him since. But I kind of, I kind of want to tell him, because he, he was, it's, it was such a good, uh, it was such a good kind of learning experience because because it was so ridiculously kind of complex and you know such a sort of mountain to climb in some ways, um, but it was so kind of good for me because it just I, I'm not really fearful of doing almost. There's probably some like Zappa I'd be afraid to. Do <laughs> yeah, but you know, but threw you in the deep end of it, didn't it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I remember being in a room in 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 just outside Paris with John, um, and he had a set up with. He had a deal with Korg, I think, and, and he had all of everything they, every keyboard they made. So, you know, like it looked like Rick Wakeman's sound, but it was John's. And John just plays like the white notes, really, so he plays in C and A minor. And, um, and, he, and he would sit and he'd like, play me these things. And I remember him, he, he actually did this. He played me two cassette players with different songs, one of Steve's and one of his own, at the same time. They're in different keys and different, uh, you know, times. Literally just two cassettes. Going, going. Yeah, it's 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 not like this. You know, I want it to be a mixture of these two. And, wow. And and it was an absolute sort of roast. And I and but but yeah, but it, but I kind of managed to get through it. And I realised sometimes we I'd play a load of stuff. 
he would go, yeah, write, write it down, Milton. Come on, write it down. And, and, I'd be, and I'd, I don't write music or read it, really, so yeah. it would just all be like stupid notes about, <laughs> you know, a princey bit or, a, you know, this stupid, trying to like... And then I'd, and I'd realised after a while that, like, I couldn't remember what I'd done. I didn't make, couldn't make sense of what I'd written, but he couldn't remember what I'd done either. It was almost it was a slight <laughs> bit of blacking going on. So I just thought if I was confident, then he kind of, you know... And he's the best thing he ever said to me. He said a lot of funny things to me, John, but the best thing was... I know, it's, I know that's what I said, but it's not what I meant. You know what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? That's, that's not what... I know, it's, I know it's not what I said. I know it's what I said, but it's not what I meant. You know what I meant. I mean, you can't, what can you... <laughs> Trying to get hit in the head. Yeah. Oh, but, wow. Um, but, yeah, but what an experience, experience that has to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it stood me in good stead, you know, forever. Once that's, you've done that, you feel yeah. confident doing anything, I guess. And then, I mean, so it was around 93 that you started. I mean, so I'll, I'll fill in the gaps for people who mm-hmm. don't know uh, Take That. I'm sure many people do. But um, basically, uh, Milton, you played with them for about 24 years. And um, they're highly successful. At the first point, they were kind of classic kind of boy band shirts off, loved by teens in the, in the 90s, um, screaming screaming fans everywhere, um, who kind of split and then came back a bit more mature and, and, and now sell uh, sell out stadium after stadium show um, to an audience that's grown up with them. Uh, Gary Barlow and Robbie Williams are household names in the UK and, and Gary wrote songs like Back For Good, um, a song that means a lot to a lot of people, uh, most beautifully used by Ricky Gervais in one of the final scenes of, of The Office, um, which was later covered by Coldplay. Uh, and Noel Gallagher actually said, if it touches people, it's a good song. And you know that thing about Take That, um, Back For Good said something to me, it touches me. Um, it's a song that you're likely to hear as a first dance at weddings and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so what's it like, Milton, um, standing in front of 80,000 people before the song starts, um, knowing the moment you play those opening chords, uh, you're going to have such an emotional impact on those people and um, if you go back 500 years it's kind of a bit of a weird social experiment with with the technology we have now that those few seconds before you start playing that song um you've got that power to kind of shift that emotional state of 80,000 people uh, at your fingertips it, it must be quite surreal I, I, it's funny to, uh, now you say that i've kind of i'm, I'm i realize that i kind of i realize i sort of just take not take it for granted it probably isn't True, but it, but it it becomes it, it because it's your job. It becomes second nature, um, and to, and just sort of assumed really. Uh, trying to think, I mean, I mean it's, it's funny because some of those songs, so "Back for Good," I think came out in around ninety five probably, um, and that and some of the some of their other songs, I I I'm still playing them as far as I'm aware. I'm still playing them the same way. I just. When we used to do take that in the old days, um, we did. You know, it was it, we didn't use any any track at all. Everything was live. It was. A, it ended up being quite a large band, like six, maybe seven at one point. But essentially, we'd use someone to send us the records. We'd have them on cassettes, and we'd try and figure out what was being played. Like you didn't get individual stems or tracks, or you know, to find out exactly. Yeah. So you would just work out what what you thought it was, which is how I how I spent my life learning how to play the guitar, listening to people's records or, and playing what you thought it was, you know. Um, and sometimes it's not quite what you think yeah. it is, you know, because there are there are kind of harmonics in the record that you, you think something's being played and it's not. So, You're probably hearing the third harmony that wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. But um, so, so, yeah, so Back for Good, when we learnt it, it, it I, I don't remember if it had been out then, it probably had, actually. Um it's yeah. It's it's. I suppose yeah. I should I should be more. Um, I should uh, treat it as a more uh, religious experience, probably, because I, I think it, it is, is to a lot of people. Though I mean, uh, yeah, you know, maybe I mean, not I, yourself, but it's to a lot of people. You can tell when you play those opening calls. I watched it over the weekend. The stadium just just changes. You know, there's yeah. There's, I, I I think so. I suppose you. I, I suppose it is just you, you know you you get used to doing. I mean, you know, I mean the the other thing you're kind of asking is what's it like to play in front of that many people yeah. um, but it, it and it doesn't really I guess if it was my song if I'd written it I, th- I think it would that would be more I, I, I would I would it would be more of an emotional I, I, I want to be in touch with my emotions and not to get too you know hippie about it but I, I don't I, I never want to like phone in a performance of anything like I'm, I, I always want to play it really the best I can and I always want to feel it I, I think that's that's what being a musician is, is the connection with your, you know, your kind of spirit and everything, all that stuff. It's not just learning the notes and 
playing is this you know you need to be feeling it so in that sense I think I, you know every time I play I mean it's, I, can, I sort of can play it I guess I could, I could play it well, I'll certainly play it with my eyes closed, but you know, without even thinking about it, yes, yeah. I, I could play it now because my fingers will play it. You play a little bit of it, the intro? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's one I can manage. You can. It is Cap on there. But uh, me, me and Mike play it together, you see, he plays acoustic. Uh, I watched you play this on David Letterman the other day. Uh, yeah, on this very guitar, really? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay, yeah, amazing. I've just, I've just brought this one out of retirement. It's been retired and it's just been at home, but. I just I just picked it up the other day and I thought oh, it's such a great guitar. It's a shame not to use it more, but it's had a couple of injuries. It got it's been dropped a couple of times and the head's been off. So, I, I, but I, it's a shame not to play it. So, I hope it's in tune. So, it's, and a three, four. I should say that um, I didn't play on that the record. It was uh, a guitar player called Phil Palmer, who's uh, one of my kind of uh, the, one of the people I really look up to. He's a British. I mean, you, you know, if you Google him, he's uh, he's all over everything. He did Wham for years and everything. And he's I think he does the, the straight thing, which is you know the uh, sort of die straights without. Oh right, okay. I, I think, but he's a proper proper great guitar player. And there's a few of those guys, and Neil Taylor's another one, you know, who. Uh, you know, they're just they're, they're they're slightly they 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 were around before me and and they're and and they're just great guitar players. You know, yeah. and I, I, it's uh, I'm God, it's really comforting to know they're still playing and still working at top level. You know, That's Whereas Neil played with Robbie for years. Oh right, okay, fine. And um, you said to me earlier that before we started recording that the technology has changed a lot um, in regards to the take that shows. Is that because of the, how grand the shows have become, and is that relating to your in ears, or is there? More it's, it's just it's really it's because it's it's because they can. It's because the technology is available. You know, as I, I probably said, you know, we, we just used to get get the records sent to us, and then we we like record them onto a cassette, <laughs> and then it's, and then you know, and try and figure out, you know, because sometimes you play it on a cassette and it would sort of be between keys. You know, you can oh, go that is E and E flat. You know, it would be somewhere in between. And we would just make a, a sort of, you know, guitar. Quite often there wouldn't be any guitars on, on the records, depending on which period. And so you just kind of make a part, like fashion a part out of what you think some of the keyboards are doing, the synthesizer or whatever. Right. Yeah, I know. And there's, there's, and then they become the part. And then it becomes like a, you know, the, the, the live, take that's live shows even right from the start were always kind of, kind of uh, held in quite high regard because we... You know, we treated it like a, a proper band, you know, and I don't mean them, I mean, we, you know, yeah. the musicians were like a proper band and we really tried to get everything we could out of the out of the songs. And then, so that was how it was then. It was all completely live. Uh, and then, you know, there was a sort of 10-year hiatus and I was doing loads of other stuff and so were they. And then um, when we came back to it, it was the, 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 the situation now is, and it is with pretty much every gig, um, they send you the stems, so you have the the framework of everything. You know, you can tell what's being played, what the drums are doing, what the, all the little bits and loops and strings and different guitar parts and stuff. And so, for me, I find it a bit. It can feel a bit limiting because you because because you know you can kind of go well. There's there's your guitar part there. You know, that's what you're supposed to be playing. Mm. Um, and. It, you know the technology's got more and more sophisticated, so it, you know you can really do a lot with it. You you know you're not restricted by the key. You know you could change the key if you want. You can do, all, but it um it it makes it easier for them to you know if they've got like you know they'll do, be running kind of video stuff on screens and whatnot, and obviously you know you can time that to, you know perfectly because yeah. you can, because 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 you're all playing to the same sort of. But it means that, that, that drummers will always be on a click. Um, yeah. It means that, 
you can't do an extra chorus if it's going well, mm. you know, all, all those sort of things. And and I, I I just you know I'm as I get older, you just you just get more kind of you know curmudgeonly and sort of more uh, you know back in my day it was better sort of thing. And I, and and you know I find myself saying those things as well, you know, just because it's just the freedom of yeah expression i think that you know when you hear old you know old records oh you know you they start in one tempo and they end in another you know uh, you know beatles records yeah motown records and all that and you'll hear bit, i love things like when you hear the guitar players playing like a line in, in the chorus and then the next time in the second chorus he's playing a bit different and it's because he's forgotten it yeah and the first time in that you know that whatever it is 16 bars or whatever but that but so you know absolutely know it's being created in that you're hearing music being created you know a recording of that and you know you find you know you know you do session and, and you kind of you know you put you put a, you get a part down for the chorus and they go yeah yeah we'll, and we'll, we'll just copy and paste that to the second chorus mm. in the middle eight you know and so you haven't actually physically played the song you've just played the, the, the kind of building blocks of the song and you know songs they're supposed to kind of breathe you know they're yeah. old they, they used to more and I think I think some producers are really aware of that, and you still have brilliant records, you know. But sometimes it's almost like they they're retroactively kind of trying to re-inject that feeling into something that's not really that, you know, that's not fundamentally that. The the only cheeky question I've got about take that, and you mm. might not be able to answer this. Um, smells like Teen Teen Spirit. <laughs> Um, it's, Was well, anyone having any kind of uh, with any of the bands saying mm, this might not be a good idea? Well. No, I mean it's it's a long, long time. I know it's just kind of reset re- yeah, yeah. really. Um, I'm sure they're thrilled, but it, but it was it. What it was was they on that tour they they wanted to do a couple of songs, uh, um, play a couple of songs by themselves, and they, they you know they 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 could play. They could, you know, I'm sure they would tell you they're not the Gary. Yeah. Gary's a, a you know really accomplished um, pianist, player, yeah. Player, but, um, and Jay, Jay, uh, you know, had played a long time, and 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 they wanted to do it. And um, the the only issue they they did a, a version of uh, another brick in the wall, which was kind of fine. Did they as well? Yeah, really. Oh, wow. but, um, but they but the reason they did Teen Spirit was well, that tour. That was the tour when Robbie left halfway through rehearsals, right? And Rob was going to sing it, and I think you, that would have made a lot more sense. Yeah, okay. For, for him to be singing it, and what they did was just. Gary went, oh, you know, we've learned it now, so I'll do it. And um, I have, I haven't rewatched it actually, and and it's, you know, it's just one of those things. But but yeah, that that was the reason. I don't, I don't think that would have been the tune that Gary would have chosen to do if if he was knew he was going to sing it. But that's how it turned out. Um, you've got incredible photos on your website. Have you kind of sitting quietly in the tour bus awaiting members to take that, take that to get on board? And there's literally a sea of people <laughs> for them to walk through. Uh, they're mobbed. It's total kind of beat Beatlemania style. Mm. This is this is back in the nineties. Um, so you've experienced that from kind of quite close proximity. That's got to be a bit of a mind bender. That having watched all that unfold. Um, hypothetically, what advice would you give to someone right now uh, beginning to experience what they went through in that level of hysteria? Um. I don't know what what I've seen is that you know um, the part of take I think part of take that's you know such great sort of popularity was that they you know they're genuinely really sweet people you know they're really and they were very uh, sort of kind with their fans and gave them the time and everything and of course as time passes and 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 they're you know and and, and a band's audience kind of grows. You, you can't, you know, you can't give everyone that same amount of time, and but um, I, it's it's interesting now because it used to be. What, I worked with a band called The Wanted, and um, mm. uh, who were, uh, you know, kind of boy band from a from a, a, a more recent time, and and they they built their um, sort of fan base. I think I'm right in saying, you know, there was like sort of Twitter and sort of YouTube and stuff. Which just you know didn't exist for, for for take that so it was take that was a, a more you know take that just did loads and loads of of like gigs in nightclubs and kind of gay clubs and stuff and took you know I don't know how long they were going a couple of years before I knew them and and they built like a proper grassroots audience that way and doing schools they go and do like school concerts and stuff and um so I guess it was quite sort of gradual for them and it, and and these days it can you know it seems to 
all of a sudden it hits really, really hard and, you know, really, really big for us. And I, I don't know how they, how you sort of cope with that. I know I sort of do, I kind of, I do Twitter, but I do it really, I'm more of a, an observer than a, than a tweeter, you know, because it's, I just use it as a kind of news feed really. But, but I see some of the shit that, that some, some sort of celebrities who's, who, who've stuck their neck out, you know, sort of made a, 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 yeah. a statement about something. Uh, the the abuse and, and that kind of didn't you know that didn't exist that that you know there was there was fan mail so if you if you were in love with you know Robbie Williams you'd write a letter and send it to his his fan club it'd be in a sack of you know yeah. thousands of letters and but you know perhaps you'd, perhaps you'd see it and I think you know they they you know they you, you, you know people used to write off and they'd get a get a signed photo or something yeah. like that and but now it's like there's this direct thing you can actually get on now and talk and potentially talk to them or, yeah. and, and they'll see it. And I, I, it's, it's. Uh, I think it's, it's quite scary, really. The, 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 the direct uh, connection you, you, you know, the audience and the and the artist have, you know, for one of a better sort of description. Um, you know, in in a way, why not? Because because why should you be in an ivory tower? You know, they are. You know, everyone is just a person, but. Uh, I I don't know how you cope with I don't know how frankly you're not famous for people, just kids I don't know how they cope with constantly being sort of you know on you know co- you know constant mm. you know Facebook and, and Instagram and all that and you know potentially you know it's that Facebook Live thing which yeah I, I, as far as I know you just you just turn it on and there you are and that what you know anything can happen can't yeah you know, yeah you, yeah you know. so. I, I don't. I don't know. I think you know. Try and protect your privacy a little, I guess. But I, you know, it's more than difficult to do. Davies, you played with him for about uh, three years. Mm. Um, and you said you talked about um, kind of uh, growing up listening to the Kings records. Um, having played on some of those songs, what are your thoughts of Dave Davies as a guitarist? Because um, he's often regarded as, as a very inspiring guitarist, um, but he's perhaps not mentioned in the same vein as some of the other greats um, because you have to listen so closely to the intricacies of his of his parts. Um, what was it like, like learning those parts and, and kind of almost full filling his shoes? If, I, alongside if I'm really honest, it's funny because for a while it was just me on kind of lead guitar or whatever. Um, and and how it happened was I was I was um, in rehearsals with Take That, and uh, a friend of mine um, was the bass player uh, called Dick Nolan, who played for uh, uh, Ray, who used to be in It Bites, and. Um, we were sort of friends, and and he he they needed a new guitar player, so uh, he recommended me to to Ray, and so what would happen is I would get a, a cassette tape with like literally seventeen or eighteen songs on it. Some of them would be Lola and uh, you know All Day and All the Night or whatever, and then there'd be stuff off other records I was less familiar with and recent stuff. And I never had time to learn all this stuff because it was because I was rehearsing the day he didn't take that, and I was literally finishing in in West London and then going up to uh, Conk Studios in in uh, Crouch End, uh, and sort of doing auditions. And and the and I must have gone up maybe three times, and they would keep sending me more more music. Actually, it must have been CDs. It can't been can't been cassettes, but. And I just I never learned it, so I was just I was constantly <laughs> blagging my way through these these things, and I, and I could never tell how how well it was going or whatever because he would keep he wouldn't just say yeah yeah you've got the gig you know he'd just say oh yeah, and then I'd get another load of songs. So and to be honest, I mean I, I kind of I've got a, a brilliant uh, recording actually. Um, I must dig it out, and it Ray got me to uh, go up to Conk where he'd sort of given me the gig. He got me to go up to comp with all all my gear, like my backline and my pedals and everything, and we sat in in the in the studio and played through the entire uh, set that we were going to do, just me and him, him, him playing his Ovation acoustic and me playing wow. my guitar parts, which I which I still I mean I, it, it it left some howlers on there because you know it, I still wasn't 
it was such a lot of songs and I was still um, and so I think I just so I was always kind of running to catch up so whatever the parts I played were some some things I was really familiar with from, from listening to them as a kid but some of them will just be whatever I whatever I kind of clung on to in that song you know whatever part I got and that became the part and um, later on Bill Shanley uh, an Irish guitarist brilliant guitar player joined as well and he was much more he really he really knew what Dave had done on the records and he, right. and he, he approached it in a much more much more professional way actually than I ever did and he really kind of got the sound so when I heard him play some of the songs like he really had some of those like 60s he kind of wiry kind of guitar sounds that not not all of it but some you know trying to think uh which songs uh yeah, you know like water he sat down and go down down go down 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 like i played it but when bill played it it really sounded like yeah like Dave Davis. yeah but i and and what ray had said to me or what people had said to me is like he doesn't necessarily want you to sound exactly like dave yeah uh and what and what i what i got from it was it was a really good band, you know, we, we really kind of locked well together, I think. And the thing is, Ray's songs are so good, like you can't really, you can't really, if you, as long as you know how they go, you can't really mess them up. And mm. he was quite, he was actually quite, uh, he, he wasn't a stickler for, this needs to sound like the band sounded in the 60s. He, he, if it kind of works, like I said, you know, I, I said, does that have a harmony on it? Because in my head, <laughs> no. in my head it has. And he went, mm, I don't think so, but, you know, I do, it sounds all right. So he wasn't afraid for his songs to be, you know, kind of, they were open to some interpretation. Um, and, and, and Dave is a, I saw the Kinks, funnily enough, uh, around, probably around middle of the 90s somewhere, maybe a bit, a little bit earlier. Uh, and Dave's a, you know, he's a great guitar player. And yeah, I suppose he's just, I suppose you know if anyone is going to get overshadowed by Ray because Ray's yeah. such a you know such a fantastic writer and it's no it's no uh, uh, it's not a negative thing about Dave at all because he's brilliant you know. Um, and what would someone a musician working closely with Ray learn from Ray that they might not learn from anyone else? <laughs> what made him unique? Hmm. Um, uh, in terms of music. I think what what well I I tell you what I definitely what Ray will do is he he'll step on the stage and then he'll just he'll just put the audience in his hand in the palm he just he, he's such a brilliant I mean he's been doing that since I don't know sixteen or seventeen yeah. or something doing gigs and that's that's what you can't I was going to say what well, you can't learn of course you can learn it but he, and that's what he did you know his apprenticeship was doing loads of gigs you know in little ship clubs and not being heard and all that. And what he does is, like, he's, he's just a fantastic... I mean, he's really intelligent and funny man anyway, so uh, he's a, he's a marvellous kind of raconteur, you know. But it's just... He, he just... He just he just brings the audience in immediately. And I mean, he, you know... I mean, we did the... We did a, a UK tour, um, and we, we, we'd done six uh, shows... And we hadn't played Waterloo Sunset. But we, it hadn't been in the set. Really? And no one had said it. Well, they probably had. But, we, you know, cause it, because he's just got song after song after yeah. song. That's probably one of the ones that everyone will say. But we hadn't done it. You know, I'm, I've got a set list, like a picture of a set list. And it's not on there. Because <laughs> he's, you know, so the the kind of, you know, the confidence in, 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 his, in his material. Yeah. And he'll just, you know, he'd do songs, and he just, and, he, and that, that's the thing, you know, obviously no track, no click, and he would just start playing, you know, Autumn Almanac or something, one of, you know, and he'll just play it all by himself, and sometimes we'd kind of join in, but we haven't yeah. quite, you know, never really rehearsed it, so, but that's the beauty, and I think, I think an audience can feel the, 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 what I was saying, the kind of, that something's actually being created before your eyes, you know, it's not, it's not this is the set list and it, it was like this last night and you know those yeah. those things inevitably become set because because you know on a tour you kind of you realise what works and stuff but you know he's 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 proper old school entertainer you know and 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 he's a he's a great guitar player I love I love some of the guitar players I've played with and because because I grew up with this having to be very precise and and that being the thing you know. I love those sort of players who are just really wide open and they just, you know, 
like Ray plays really hard, he really digs in, you know, he's yeah. playing like an ovation acoustic through a twin, you know, yeah. that's, that's what I mic'd up, so that's what you're hearing, but it's like, it's, it's kind of really sort of punky in a way, you know, but really kind of real and, you know, visceral, I love that. Great. Um, high pressure, high profile gigs, you don't really strike me as someone who gets kind of super nervous or anything like that, but you played some, played some pretty big ones, and I'm guessing the Queen's Diamond Jubilee with Her Majesty watching on uh, with enormous worldwide uh, viewing figures uh, on the bill that day with the likes of Robbie Williams, Will I Am, um, I know Paul McCartney, Elton John and Stevie Wonder turned up with their own band, but you, you played with Grace Jones, Annie Lennox, loads, loads more. Um, always strikes me those kind of gigs where you do one song with one artist and, and, and it moves on and it rotates. Always strikes me that a lot could go wrong on days like that. What are the main anxieties over a show like that? The reality is I've done a few of those things. Um, that the, the reality of those sort of shows, it's funny, if you, when you're at home and you watch something like that, and I've, you know, I've watched those things with other, with other people doing them, and because it's on TV and, and, and you know, it has a sheen of, of kind of, uh, I was going to say professionalism, obviously it's professional, but it has a, a sheen of like organisation. And when you're in it, it, it can be absolute chaos or relative chaos because, like, so, so, you know, so the set, they built a stage set outside, uh, directly outside Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. Palace on that Victoria. They built it around the, the monument yeah. of Scott Victoria. Right, and, 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 it, and there was no real... We were lucky with the weather, but the night before when we were trying to... When people were trying to do sound checks, you know, it was chucking down with rain... I've got photos of, you know, Kylie and all her dancers in, like, you know, in, uh, you know, pack and mouse and everything, kegels and that, trying to do things, sliding all over. But, and on the day, they, 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 they made, like, um, you know, it's a whole kind of cordoned off area and there's a special branch and all that because, you know, the queen yeah. is going to be there. And, and, um, and they made, like, temporary uh, uh, dressing rooms in um, Green Park, and we had a guy, like a, a guy who was our runner, and he said, oh, my name's Sam, so, like, and they've all got, you know, the kind of walkie-talkie things and that. And uh, he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking after you guys today, so anything you want, just, you know, just tell me, and it's, it'll all be cool. And we never saw him again. We saw him, we saw him like, in the morning. I swear we never saw him again. And it, it got to be, like, um, nearly showtime, and we all got dressed and everything. We know it's starting at court today, wherever it was, half seven. And then, and then we just went, because it's a bit of a walk, it's like a five, ten minute walk from there to kind of backstage, which is near the gates mm. of Buckingham. But we went, should we, should we have a walk out there? And we, I suppose so. so. So we kind of wandered out there and we basically wandered about and, and, and we didn't, like no one, it was such a, it was such a panic, there'd be, you know, there'd be people like, Going, go on, go on, go now, go now. Like, no, no, not now, not now. Oh, you know? no. And we'd be like running back. And literally there were bits where someone had finished doing a link. You know, I can't remember. There'd be, you know, Miranda or someone doing a link. And then we'd, and then we'd be like reading a, a, a running order, which had everything on it, like all the timings for everything, you know. And going, shit, that's up, that's up. It's ours, it's ours, it's ours, get on. And we'd run and we did one tune where, I don't remember what the song was, but Annie Lennox was on next. And she'd said, she'd mentioned at some time in rehearsal or whatever that she wanted everyone to be wearing um, uh, angel wings yeah I saw the video of it yeah <laughs> so, the, so the orchestra were weren't they yeah. but I did see you so, and, then, and then Cam was never mentioned again and then we and then we were playing whatever the previous song was and so and I'm playing a song on TV Buckingham Pat, you know and all that on, you know guys beaming and someone's tapping me on the shoulder Try, and, 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 and I'm like trying and they've got a pair of angel wings and they're kind of like you know gesturing we need you to put these on and I'm like I'm playing a song here yeah. like, you know? <laughs> and, the, and, they, and they did it they, did that, they, put, they tried to put on and Donovan Donovan's a really muscular guy and they just like peeled off I think and then so someone's I didn't I, I didn't I didn't put any on but it was just it was just you know these are the sort of things that you, you just you know the, what you're thinking about is like oh I hope I'm in tune I hope you know I hope my, my pedals you know have I got have I got the right you know what guitar am I playing on this next song is yeah. it cap you know and it's and honestly those things often you get you you get on stage and you go I haven't got a set list and I and I, I, I never know like I know I have to read a set list I never know what the next song is so what what happens with those things you get to the end of them and then you just go thank God that. You know that that thing didn't go wrong. We did another one uh, in Edinburgh, um, 
at, at Edinburgh Castle, and it was the same thing with Smokey Robinson and yeah, I watched Stella, it, yeah. Jessica. Well, we did one song uh, where we did a song with uh, we we were supposed to do three songs, I think, with Smokey, who was who was absolutely lovely. He came and gave everyone a hug. He, he had something nice to say to everyone. It was absolute what a joy, you know, because he's a proper legend and he was he was sweet sweet as anything. But he he. It's same, and it would be the same for him. Like he did, he did whatever the song was, and then he kind of went, "Thank you, goodbye," and walked off. And we've got two more songs to do. Oh, and then and then so then we start playing a song, and then he and he's on the mic going, um, "Ah, this this isn't, uh, you know, because he, he, he obviously hadn't been told what we were supposed to do." And then and um, and we did. Uh, we did a song who was uh, grooving together, and it was a duet with Jesse J. And it was it was it was a car, and we had an orchestra and everything as yeah. well. It was like a, a car crash, you know, slow motion, and and actually Jesse J. Figured out what had happened and came in and sang, like came on stage and sang her bit. Wow! And then and pulled it together, and then and then everyone knew where they were. But it was really like it could have just fallen apart. Wow! And these and these are the th- and the reason for that is. And actually, I'll say this, like, when you do TV things, things that are televised, so the Jubilee and this, this uh, Edinburgh thing, is that it, so much of the focus is on the visual. They care so much about that. And, the, and I think they just imagine that we can just do it under any circumstances, mm. any conditions. And so you would be, like, on one show, we were on stage and... Uh, you know, we had a monitor engineer who was under the deck, under the under the stage, so you couldn't we couldn't see him. Mm. And we started doing started doing this song, and uh, and the, the monitors were all over the place, and you couldn't. Play. And in the end, and we were trying to get messages to people because we're playing, you know, and trying yeah. to. And um, and and one and our and our keyboard player Marcus, I think, in a in a gap there was a, and just he went down under the stage to see the um Melanie was on this key too to see the uh our monitor engineer and he was sitting in the corner with his head in his hands nowhere near the desk because basically each artist that came on yeah they had a monitor engineer who said right you get off there well, I'm doing this and then and proceeded to mix, mix. what they thought we were oh wow and 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 there'd be I mean I can't it's hard to I mean it's it's funny and these are these are things that you know, they're kind of you just you just take them in your stride. You know, you just just I've had you know I've done I did one where they wheeled on the wrong <laughs> the risers for the wrong band in front of us, and then they couldn't get them off in time, so they just stay there. So I remember doing a gig on TV. You can just see this like bell tree <laughs> dangling in front of me, and a, and then a bemused drummer sitting on his kit in front of me because because he he can't get off. It's too late. You know? <laughs> so. The, you know these. The, you know the, the things. I you know I once played with Anderson Roof with Wayne the House. So anything. You know these are the things that. You know I can cope with any number of you know pop mishaps. You know <laughs> have to do in that gig really. What are the common personality traits of highly successful music, musicians uh, that sets them apart from those on their way up the ladder? Uh, I don't know if there's anything that sets them apart, really. I, it, it's 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 just kind of obvious, personality-wise. It's just, you know, don't be a diva, but but and be and and keep. I mean, just always keep your ears open, really. Just just listen to what people are telling you, and and you you'll find yourself working with artists who ne- who can't necessarily, who don't necessarily have the vocabulary vocabulary to explain what it is they want. Yeah, they know what they want. But they, they, they don't know how to tell you in a way. So you have to really, you know, be able to interpret, you know, and, and listen to what someone's saying. And don't don't get, you know, upset and stop about if they don't like what you do. You know, it's just, you have to be, if you want to do, kind of be a hired sort of hand for, you know, for, for, for artists, you just have to be flexible and don't take it personally if they if they go, you know, that sounds great, but, but don't do it ever again, you know. Um, and in terms of personality, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, just, you know, be amenable, you know, obviously turn up on time, don't be roaring drunk, don't be, you know, yeah. you know, sort of drugged up so you don't understand anyone, what anyone's saying. Um, and, you know, kind of like, like, like any, I suppose, like any job really, you know, get on with people, sort of, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a mystery. 
Um, the musically, I'd say the biggest thing is what I touched on it earlier is that you know if you've grown up, it's, it's not always helpful if you've grown up focusing just on one genre of music, and unless that's what you're going to do, and and you know like if if you know, I've met some musicians who play a particular way. And they've gone, but there's no money in it, so I'm I'm doing pop now. Mm. Uh, but they're not particular. They don't particularly like pop, and they don't really, you know, they're not really enjoying doing it. It's a little beneath them. This is not a it's, it's kind of generalisation. It's yeah. not true of that many people, but it can be. So, you know, if you're playing with artist A and it's not particularly your thing, you don't really want that to come out in your performance with them. You know, you you, you want them to feel like you're they're important on that day. And and you know, I've I wouldn't listen to the records of everyone that I've worked for over the years, but I I I don't think I ever go. I never did it with, like with you know with my tongue in my cheek or you, mm. you know what I mean. It, it was always I always gave it my best and generally because because if you're playing music, there's you there's always something you can get out of a song. You know, yeah. there's all there's always you can always give it a put in a good performance and make it make it work. What are the challenges facing young musicians today that didn't? exist when you started out do you think Mm. other than the social media element that you mentioned earlier and and the abuse that people can get well as I said I I think we when I when I started kind of doing sort of sessions and playing live for people we were still a necessary evil in the nicest possible way you know you, you couldn't do a tour without you pretty much couldn't do it at all. We certainly couldn't do it without, without a drummer, a bass player, and a guitarist, and a, you know, perhaps a keyboard player. And you could it, gradually the the onus moved from the kind of you know the, the 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 raw necessities of those of those instruments and those players to you know I, I remember being at all that didn't happen, but it, you know they they figured out they could do it with two or three musicians because they because they could run everything else on track and it was just like they were just going what's the what's the minimum like what's the lowest common denominator and it was still look like a group you know? mm. it, was, it was kind of three or possibly two <laughs> I think unless you're like Royal Blood or something but that's yeah. that's a that's a thing you know they've made that thing but generally um, you, you know you used to you know I I used to I think I got gigs because I was a good player and all the things I've said, listen to what people want and everything. And also I sing pretty well. So you're getting two, two, you know, two people for the price of one. Well, you, you don't need the band to sing because you can run it off track if you want now. So, so immediately that, you know, that kind of strength is something that's less important. You know, it's less, less valuable as a kind of commodity, if you like. So... You know, you still need to do you just. You know, you still need to do the same things, but you know, but get as good as you can get. Keep listening, listen to all the different kinds of music. Uh, but it, but it's, but it is tough because you, you, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, ne- we're not necessary in the same way. It sounds a terrible thing to say, but it, it, you know, it's, it's technology. It's yeah, same, yeah. Same as, you know. If you wanted, if you wanted a nice photograph of your of, of your family or something twenty years ago. You'd probably go to a professional photographer to a studio. Yeah. And he'd light it and thing, and then you'd and you'd pay him for his time, and he'd print it, and you know, and that's a that was a thing. But now, you know, you can kind of if you you know with your phone, you can probably do it on an iPhone six. It'll look mm. alright. You can sort of yeah. mess about with it, and you know, put a filter on it. And you, if you show that to a professional photographer, I have a friend who's a professional photographer. He'll just go, yeah, no, it's just it's a sh- it's a shit photo. And they just put a, you know, on it. But, 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 I, but I wouldn't necessarily know the difference. Nice. And so my attitude towards photography and, 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 you know, is the same as most people's actual attitude to musicians. You yeah. still just go, you go, I've made this thing on my garage band and, you know, all the, it's all in tune and in time. And, and people go, yeah, that's, that sounds good. You could, you could put that on the radio. I might buy that. You know, and you go, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah didn't take you know it took 10 minutes to do and it's do you know what I mean but if you you know people only know their own field really and I think people imagine you know they don't see the work that goes into making a record the same as they don't see the work that goes into a you know cover shoot for yeah, yeah, yeah. or something you know you just see a picture of a person or a sound of someone playing the guitar so it's 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 a tricky one 
I think like you know records is is a funny old business now because because the, the you know streaming and thing and illegal download you know so I don't know quite how people make a living you know I used to play on records for money you know that used to be a thing, thing yeah in the nineties and the early two thousand but you know I don't do that in the same way anymore because it because you know there aren't the budgets people aren't you know they don't sell the way they did so yeah. But playing live, I think, is still a. I think will always be a thing, actually. And if you go in a bar, and see, you know, hopefully like a whole band, you know. But if you see someone singing and playing a song, I, I think everyone can get that. And and in a way more because if it's just a fellow with an acoustic guitar and voice, or you know, a duo, or whatever, you know, there's not really anywhere to hide. So you can you can hear that that's real people doing mm. a real thing in a room you're in, and that's. I think I think that. that that will always touch people, I think. Okay, final question. 20, 30 years time from now, how do you think you'll look back on your career? <laughs> I'm already doing it now. Um, I th- well, I, you know, it, with each sort of generation, I think you always, you know, like I, what I look back at now, so I'm 54 now, and what I look back at is uh, the 60s and the 70s as being gold. It's so, you know, so, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, yeah. the Kinks, all that, then through Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple. Uh, yes, actually, retrospectively, I, you know, having worked with them, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a real fondness for them, for the music. But, and so, and so when I look back, you know, when you see, see um, you know, stuff of, you know, I don't know, like Free, you know, Paul Cross stuff and that, all, all, all those bands, you know, that, just the freedom that they had and the fact that music was a massive selling industry that would that for a while was was led by the creators of that you know i know there was always managers there was always record companies and all that but essentially you know like bands would go you know stevie wonder when he made songs in the key of life i mean you know he went from making brilliant pop records you know to making this huge record that that nearly you know that potentially nearly bankrupted Motown you know because it, it and he and he basically went you know I, was, I remember watching a documentary and I think he just sort of said yeah I, th- I think it's gonna be actually it's gonna be a double album and they went okay okay and then he went it's gonna be a double album with like an EP because I've got all these songs you know and if I don't know if you know that record it's just yeah. chock full of beauties and yeah, most true. amazing record amazing Prolific. performances you know, Greg Phil and Gaines is on it. All the all the all the boys are on it. You know, all the all the brilliant players, and it's an absolute, just a wide open kind of lovely thing. You know, and he was allowed to do that because mm. because because he was Stevie bleeding one day. You know, and and, and I don't think he, you know that record. I, you know, I don't know what it sold. It, you know, of millions and millions and millions, and and you could say that about you know a lot of records that. They, you know, the the bands just, you know, grew their hair long, got big old beards and flares and stuff, and then just made whatever music they wanted to make, and and the and the and the record labels because there was so much money for them in it, you know, because they knew they, you know, a new Deep Purple record or a Led Zeppelin record was going to sell multi billions, they could afford to let the bands do that, and I just think what a, what a brilliant time, you know, what a brilliant time to so so <laughs> to answer your question it didn't feel that way when I was doing it it felt a lot more kind of you know contra- controlled and contrived and pop you know but now when I look back at the, at the 80s I think blimey no it still was you still you know if you you know Jason Donovan had a, a proper band and Rick Astley had a proper band yeah. and Five Star had a band you know I had friends who played in these people's bands and and, and got they got paid proper money that actually in numbers it's probably about what you get now, you know. Yeah. Probably, you know, I mean, the actual figure is probably the same as it was in wow. the '80s, you know, to play with an equivalent artist and maybe less because it, you know, because they don't need you in the same way. So I think when I look back, I'll, I'll, I don't know where music's going, and as I say, I'm turning into an old git, you know, rapidly. But I'll probably look back and go, "Blimey, I was I was lucky to have been in it at all," you know, because there was still there were still budgets. To yeah. pay musicians to make music, you know. Fantastic. Um, were there any career highlights that you, we haven't covered that you wanted to speak about? Was there any pinch of skin moments that you really want to talk about, or people you worked with that we haven't covered? I've done odd. I mean, just odd snapshots. Like I did, we did a. I went over with um, 
the British Rock Symphony, it's called, which is a, a, a kind of, they, they do it every year, I think, and it was like, it's our rock band and a symphony orchestra, but we went out to Brazil and Argentina and did that, and it was uh, John Anderson out of Yes, and Alice Cooper, and uh, someone else good, I can't, Tony Hadley, uh, and some, another artist I forget, but I remember we, we, we learned um, uh, schools out, and I just remember Alice coming on stage, <laughs> and it's Alice Cooper, you know, just put, you're doing the sound check. And he just, and he, and, he, and he went, I bet you played this in your first high school band. And, it, and I absolutely did. I just, <laughs> what a brilliant thing for him to know. Because, you know, down around, down around, down around. And, I, you know, and, and so it's, just, you know, those are the things where you meet people. <clears throat> I once, we, I did a, a, a show, uh, it was a charity show for uh, sickle cell anemia, a, a charity for that. And, um, we were playing with loads of different artists at house band, but Shaka Khan was coming because she was in a show in London, and they'd invited her to come. And they and the MD said, um, "Look, we'll learn Ain't Nobody, and then we'll be playing it when she enters the room. It's like a big old you know dinner thing, uh, and then maybe she'll get up and play it." And so we did, and she got up and, and sang it, which is genius. But then she and so when it finished, and then she wanted to do another one, so she turned to the drummer and said. Do you know? And she said the title of a song. I didn't hear what it was. And he went, "Yeah," and counted it in, started playing it. And but oh, I didn't hear no. what he So I, I mean, I can't. It's, I've kind of blanked it out because we because I have no idea what we played, what we were playing. You know. And oh. We, and that's what that would have been handy to have in ears because someone could have told me, I guess. But <laughs> so we so we like Pete's doing like Ain't Nobody with Shaka Khan. She's I don't put her on my CV because I don't think it really counts. But <laughs> and particularly because she might go, "What are you that <laughs> those guys who could do no?" Whatever the roof is somewhere. Mick Jagger's on my CV. Yeah. Um, you played on a record, is it? Is I right? played on, he, he, um, I think it's called God is in the Doorway, the album. I just played on one record, but uh, one track rather. But why, But when we, when we record, before we recorded it, uh, a good friend of mine is called Matt Clifford and he's collaborated with me. So he, he played with on the Anderson Bruford right. Power record with me in 88, then went on to work with the Stones and, uh, and he got me over to Paris uh, for two days because Mick was working on a new uh, that album what became that album and he just wanted to kind of routine the songs which just means like just knock ideas about and play so we just so me uh, Matt and Jagger sat in a room for sort of two days in a in a studio in Paris just with you know like a computer and some keyboards and a couple of and so for two days I just sat opposite Mick Jagger wow. playing playing guitar and just 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 sort of trying to compliment these songs that he had and half ideas they were working on and stuff uh, and it was the most amazing you know again because these are people that I grew up you know sort of fantasising about you know playing in bands and stuff and you know pretending I was in the Rolling Stones or whatever and, and what so, was that interaction like what was that what, what was he like to work with was he, he easy was, to work he with was, yeah and, and in my experience you know the, the, the bigger people are the you know I'm sure there are exceptions but generally they're very, they have nothing to prove generally and he just he, you know I, I, he, he went uh, you know, hi, I'm Mick. You know, and they, I love that when they say their name, like you, you know, because it's just politeness. But you, you know, in case you might not, know, yeah. you know, do you want a cup of tea? And so, you know, and all that. And um, and he played, and he, he played like a strap with the five strings tune. You know, like like because obviously those are the, probably the guitars that are always around. You know, the keys guitars or whatever that he that he would always pick up. And um, I mean, uh, it's a bit of a blur really because you because you end up just um, sort of looking at him like you know sort of. You know, sort of trying to because you never get to see people that close. You know, you yeah. just sort of, but um, is it hard to keep you kind of focus on the job or not really? Because I, I think it's just I think you know in in again you know if you know if you if you're a decent musician you know you, you there's a sort of double edged you know, like a two layered thing where at the one hand you're kind of going it's Mick Jagger it's Mick Jagger it's Mick Jagger you know and at the same time. It's Mick Jagger who's trying to figure out his songs, and, and you're there to, to to do that job. So, 
I think it's quite, it's actually, it actually makes sense. I, I, I've never worked with, I was trying to think if I've, no, I, did, I auditioned for Brian May's band once, so I didn't get the gig, but I, but I, but I we spent half an hour or so like playing, you know, with Cozy Powell and, wow. and, uh, and playing, I had a little go on the Red Special and, uh, and, uh, you know, it, I, it, I didn't get the gig, but it was one of my happiest, you know, <laughs> half hours because <laughs> he was such a proper idol and he was an absolute gent, you know, yeah. just, just a kind of lovely man. And, that, you know, those, those are the highlights. Some gigs I didn't get are actually some of my highlights just because just just to be in the room and those, you know, when, and when I look back when I'm, you know, when I'm properly in my dotage and looking back I, you know I will go well you know I was kind of good enough at least to be in a room with Brian May and then be in a room with Mick Jagger and be in a room with Ray or Jeff or you know and and you know there's a danger with kind of looking back and you know sort of reverie and stuff but you know they, they, these are brilliant moments and, and I'm, I'm honestly grateful to have to have had them at all you know it's great that you say that because there's so so many uh, musicians who we listen to this and uh, all over the world who would who would give anything to have some of the experiences you have and um, I wish you good luck in the summer I know you've got to take that gigs and uh, uh, Wembley Stadium with Jeff I'm actually at that gig I'm going to that oh, I'm taking my dad brilliant. to that yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, um, you're going to love it I mean it's you know it's just song after song really you know it's good, it's good. and I think we, honestly I think we you know we we really do it justice it's, it's we, we're, we're aware of the what it means to people you know I mean all as I said before all the gigs I feel that but but Jeff's one is you know it's he, he was a long time away for people I think so it's important to get it right you know it's it's going to be great so thank you for giving such a, a great insight you're a true unsung hero of the music <laughs> industry uh, thanks for all your advice and uh, as I say your insight and thanks for being such a great guest on the stage left podcast absolute pleasure and quite beautifully to play us out uh, Milton's going to play a bit of Mr Blue Sky by Hello. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Milton. And that's uh, put, put a smile on your face. And thanks for being such a great guest. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. For more episodes featuring the likes of Lawrence Juba on what it was like working with three of the Beatles, Tony Visconti on producing David Bowie, uh, and Jennifer Batten on um, playing with Michael Jackson for over a decade, um, go to the stageleftpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at the Stage Left Pod, like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Stage Left Podcast, um, follow us on Instagram if you can, because we've got some great behind the scene photos on there, and please subscribe, that's how you find out about new episodes, uh, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify and podcast apps, however you're listening to it. Uh, thanks for listening, the next episode um, is at the end of the next month uh, with uh, a member of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. <laughs>